Um, so to work backwards is when do you start? When do we start looking for new hospitalists? And every most most programs have turnovers. Um, obviously, so most programs are looking for hospitalists usually six months before they need them. Um, so it'll be the you know November December we start interviewing people. The, the sooner the better. That way we have. Um, because the credentialing process, the licensing process, the moving process takes a while. So you guys are obviously in way beyond, way early in all this, but when you're a second year and you're towards the end of the, the, the end of your second year, that's when we, you should start thinking where you want to go and, and, um, and then start trying to make connections of people who can um, interview you for your future job. But I guess to backtrack a little bit, just to, you know, what kind of hospice gigs are there? I think we all know there's academic hospitalists. But that in, within that academic hospital structure, there's a lot. There, there are there are a lot of different structures in academic hospitals, and we'll come back to that. And there's always a private private hospitals, of course, and and then there's a VA, which is our little world. That's Dr. Benton can elaborate on that. Um, and so, it really, the most important thing for I think as a hospital is where you want to go. That's that's probably where you start. Most people don't shoot their CV all across the country looking for a hospice gig based on academia. They just say, I want to go to Cincinnati, and therefore you work backwards. So, you know, and so if you are interested in being a hospitalist, um, most of you guys probably know it's an in academic hospital medicine. That's, um, then you just got to ask yourself, what region am I interested in? Um, that's kind of like a, a second year kind of level. From a first year level, I mean, you know, to get you prepped and your CV all pumped up for that academic hospitalist gig, then, you know, we, we, we aren't, we aren't going to ask you to do 8,000 research. Um, most of the time, when as an at, uh, as an interviewer for hospitalists, we look for the very basic stuff. You know, are you are you competent? Are you are you able to handle the workload? Are you a good teacher to the residents? Have you done the appropriate stuff as far as in, um, educating medical students? Have your CV look reasonable? We don't expect you to write um, primary journal articles and X, Y, and Z things like a GI fellow or or a um, a oncology fellow may need. Um, hopefully, if you attend ACP, ACP or SHM, great. That, that, that's probably be fine. You present a poster at ACP or Georgetown Research Day. That looks good in your CV. And, and none of us on the interviews ever asked you to elaborate on your wonderful research. It's more about what's your, what's your field of interest in hospital medicine. Um, and that could be anything, you know, a couple of years ago, what was it, um, patient satisfaction or some, some, uh, some readmissions or something. So if you, as a first or second year right now, you guys should consider if you're in hospital medicine, what's your niche? What, what are you interested in? You know, uh, quality, Dr. Montero was it, um, quality improvement, that's always rings a bell. People always get, uh, say, I'm, I'm doing a QI project. Um, so if you are interested in hospital medicine, just find a niche that you might want to elaborate on. It once again, this has to be something published. It should just be, you know, I, I did a project on, on uh, you know, communication between the nursing staff and residents. I did a, um, a back then was med rec. I did a X, Y, and Z. So find something that you actually are passionate about and then want to get involved in so you can talk about it in your interview. And in theory, even publish on, you know, Dr. Tim Pone's AC, uh, um, hospital medicine research, I mean, um, um, Georgetown Research Day or something. So that kind of CV builder is probably sufficient for the most part to get into, um, to get your foot, um, to talk about doing interviews. If you have an interest that you haven't developed yet, that's okay too. Saying, hey, I want to be a, a proceduralist. Um, I did work with Dr. Fisher and, and, you know, and I did uh, a month long with him on the procedure service and I would love to continue that here. And most, a lot of, a lot of houses do not have a procedure service and there'll be an old guys like me who hates to do procedures would love to have a young, young blood who actually likes this kind of stuff. So, so that can be your little niche when you go in to get yourself in the door. Um, I'll try not to talk too much more, but, um, uh, so find a niche for yourself, develop that, and that can be your, your thing that makes you stand out among all the other applicants. And then it comes down to the application process. And once again, Rita and Shenye can elaborate more, but what people always ask me, what do you do next? I say, well, you want to go to a city, that, that's where then, then you work backwards. There's an academic institution there. You can either ask one of us, who we know there are 25 hospitalists and a bunch of attendings and so forth, who likely have a connection over there. That may be the easiest way to get in for an interview. You would call this person saying, hey, can I, um, I have this great resident who wants to go to your facility. Do you have, a, do you have any space available? Then make a little, little introduction. Sometimes you get desperate like Pat Cheney did and he just cold call people 
um, um, hospice directors, and then and then and then usually these patients, these guys would have would have um, job openings that are not posted. Looking for job posting online is impossible. Looking on the university website, looking for job posting doesn't happen. It's mostly by word of mouth and and just calling the 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 hospital director and ask him or the office saying, hey, is there a job available? Um, so uh, and then as far as private hospitals, similarly, you know, you you if you want to go to Virginia Hospital Center, don't look at BAC website. Talk to the people you, who know somebody over there, or talk to that director over there and saying, hey, do you have a job available? I'm a graduate. Being a hospitalist, the job aren't, aren't as easy as they used to be. Like Dr. Poon actually had to work to get her job. Um, not like me, who just stays hired because they have nobody else. Um, but it's still, it's still pretty easy to get a hospice job out there. Um, once you get that interview, though, then we should talk on it separately because different facilities have different structures and you need to know what you're walking into. But that's, a, that's more of a question down the line um, uh, once you... Um, once you get it into that that kind that kind of that kind of place, what I'm trying to lap, move to more towards is that would the would the place be fair to you? Are you being hired as an academic hospitalist, or you can be hired as a a pretty much a a non-covered doctor for 95 percent of the year, and for five percent of the year you get to hang out with fourth-year medical students, which some structures have. But we can talk more about that if you, once you guys are at that level of interview, be like near the interview time. Well, I talk plenty. I don't want to, um, uh, in case you guys have questions, um, uh, jump in. But I, I'm sure Dr. Poon and, and Shenya has a lot to say and, and Pat maybe a little. I actually want to add to that as another resource that I use heavily, specifically because I was trying to stay in this area, was um, each hospital or each hospital system has their own recruiter that is interested in um, finding physicians. And so I went through them. That really helped me um, kind of reach out, for example, the INOVA system had a recruiter that then had several locations and other hospital systems out in more rural areas and then out in West Virginia also had their own recruiters that I found very helpful to work with. And MedStar also has um, a recruiting system. So there's like a number I called, I talked to them, told them my interest in areas I wanted to stay in. And then it led to like a flood of emails from recruiters all across the areas of, of my interest. And it just happened that this year the hospital market was very saturated, so there wasn't a lot of offices in Northern Virginia, but elsewhere there are plenty of offers with great pay, um, and they were willing to reach out to me and kind of set up appointments. So that was another resource that could be used. I guess I'll piggyback in. Um, what I will recommend is don't say that you know Dr. Songkrat because then you'll just shoot yourself in the foot. And then you will have to cold call people, but uh, but on a serious note, I used um, I think I th I would say I used four different resources. One, I used Dr. Sankarat, uh, and he would just reach out to people. I was like, I'm interested in this city, and he was like, Yo, let me see if I know somebody. And he invariably knows somebody everywhere. Um, so I, I reached out to him in like October, I believe, of the beginning of of this third year. Uh, then number two, as Shenya was talking about, there's recruiters, but the recruiters usually just blast you, like flood you with email, and it's almost too much. Um, but you definitely just have to be on top and like sort through the things that you want. Uh, number three, you can look online yourself at um, programs that you're interested in. Like Dr. Um, Sagra was saying that unfortunately the academic postings are listed in the medical school that funds you, not necessarily in the hospital. Um, and then the the other option you can use is I actually went to New England Journal of Medicine job careers and they post postings um, in that little group um, that you can basically sort by academic city and size and I got a that's how I got the job that I'm at now um, and then finally you can also just cold call people so I'm from Boston and I know a lot of people who went to residency in Boston and I said hey who's the head hospitalist they gave me a number and an email address. I emailed them. I said, hey, I want to come back to Boston. Uh, and I would just send my CV and say, hey, if you're interested, give me a call. And then like people at the end of the day would say, hey, can you call me right now? Uh, so as Dr. Sarah was saying, it's really all word of mouth. And that's how you're going to get your most advice is by looking up who's the head hospitalist, shooting them an email, and they'll get back to you so much faster than if you use any of those other resources. 
uh, just to add to Pat's um, comment, most of the time hospitalists, these things cost money to post uh, advertisement stuff, so we don't do that. And as you know, we have a lot, we're very incestuous, we get a lot of people who we know. So usually that's the best way to make sure, to get, stay ahead of the advertisement, which we kind of go a lot out of desperation for the most part, is uh, to reach out to that hospice director. I think that's the most the the the, the easiest way to uh, and um, to to guarantee yourself an early early interview. Absolutely agree. Dr. Poon, can you let us know about your experience? Yeah. So. Um... Basically, I did the same thing. I actually, so the way I got my job here at Georgetown, I had a friend who worked with Dr. Salters at UVA and Dr. Salters referred me to Michael and Michael, um, like I, I think I reached out maybe in October or so. Uh, Michael Molino interviewed me maybe November um, as like a, hey, I'm interested. And then they went back and looked at the, a budget for the year. Um, and so that, that was my experience here. I basically knew I'm from Montgomery County, Maryland. I knew I was going to come back to this area. And so I just reached out to my old mentors at Maryland where I went to medical school, um, the VA up there in Baltimore, um, emailed uh, GW, just wanted to be, I knew I wanted to be an academic place. So I think early on, you have to decide if you want to do academics or if you want to do community. If you want to do community, it's actually, I think the recruiters are probably um, even a better bet because like I think that then you kind of get your wider gamut of like all the options out there um, but I think academic is a very unique process where I think go going directly to hospital directors um, or hospital medicine directors is the way to go so I think that's where you have to kind of start and I'm happy to talk to you guys further about like kind of what made me decide to do academic um, versus fellowship. I was going to do palm crit and then did my chief year and decided that I really loved academics and really loved um, just general medicine and hospital medicine. So that's kind of the route I went down. So as a first year, I wish that I had decided earlier um, because even with academic medicine, there's obviously different facets. And I think that's one of the questions later on about what does academic medicine look like. Academic medicine at Georgetown is going to be very different compared to academic medicine at Harvard or Hopkins, or even what academic medicine looked like at Wake Forest where I did my residency. And like Dr. Sankarat alluded to, it depends on how much um, time you have doing actual educational activities with residents and then there's also at certain places there's um, buyout time depending on your research history and how much um, kind of clinical time you have versus academic time to do your own research and some of that might be more important at more like academic places like the ivies um, just so that if, if you're looking for a lifelong career in academic medicine, it's, it helps you to kind of rise up in the ranks in those kinds of places. So um, there, there's a gamut and I learned a lot about that as I was going through the process of talking to folks. I, you know, I wanted to come back to DC, but I was open to going around the country if I could have, um, but so I learned a lot about the process. Happy to talk more about that. Happy to uh, comment on um, primary care and how that uh, compares in hospital medicine. Surprisingly similar. Um, I think the major take homes from my side would be uh, set your sights on either a geographic location or a, an area um, of practice that you're interested in. Um, network, talk to someone who knows someone, um, get your CV in order. Generally speaking, you'll find an email address, you'll get an e-introduction through a colleague to a, a division chief or a department chair. And then you'll wanna be ready with a very brief kind of cover letter, which really is just the body of an email, like a quick paragraph about what you're interested in um, and maybe what sets you apart. And then you're gonna attach your CV. Make sure your CV stays up to date. 
Um, from my experience, you guys don't uh, give yourself enough credit in terms of all the amazing things that you do that are just inherent to this program. So you should have a separate area of your CV that highlights like your QI work, which is not something that is done um, at every program. Um, other activities you might think are unworthy of a CV, but they certainly are. So fix up your CD, talk to someone who knows someone, and um, it's it's never too early to, to get all your ducks in a row. Like, you know, over the summer is a great time to get your CV in shape um, and aim to send out your letters of interest or at least getting in touch with people, I don't know, August, September, October. That's it for my side. I will say that my CV was just a dumpster fire and then Dr. Ayub <laughs> made it very nice. And, and again, she's, she's right. We don't add enough stuff in there um, of stuff that you accomplish throughout residency. So definitely touch it up, talk to somebody, talk to one of your attendings or faculty um, about it um, in the field that you're going, you know, hospital medicine or primary care, and they'll be able to make it, um, you know, remind you of things that'll help you stick out a little bit more. Um, and I will say in, in terms of primary care, I mean, and also hospital medicine, it, it, you know, for the most part, it's a buyer's market. And, and like Dr. Sinker was saying, like, you really need to figure out where you want to go. Um, and that definitely applies to primary care as well. And the Georgetown network um, is very big in terms of who we know and people that we can connect you with, no matter where you go, I'm sure we can find somebody in that area uh, at that a hospital, especially if it's an academic place, private, probably a little harder you know, to know people, but if it's in academia, um, in the, you know, all around this country, like we could probably find somebody in the Georgetown network who either is there or knows somebody there. Um, and so, so please, like, you know, when, when the time comes, summer, you know, fall next year, like, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, and, you know, we can get you in touch with somebody, especially, lo I mean, local by far. Like, we, I think we have every place cover that we can find somebody that we know um, to help you out. But, but even, you know, far abroad or far across the country, we can, you know, connect you with somebody uh, for sure. And um, there was a question in the chat about, is there like a CV template? I'll just post one. I just Googled SGIM CV template and there's some really good advice from the Society of General Internal Medicine that I'll just post mm -hmm. in the chat in a second. I think Zima has a question about, I mean, I'm not an attending yet, but about transitioning from academia to the private sector. Oh, um, in fact, um, as a as a hospital Zima, I, I, you know, it, unfortunately, if you were to go out um, private and then you come back in, it's going to be a little harder um, because then, you know, usually at that couple of years where you're private, you're not doing anything quote academic, and then more more so, you're not doing, you're not you're not educating residents, and we obviously want residents, uh, I mean, new attendings who can teach medical students and, and residents too. And then we're, we're going to wonder why did you go into private and then come out of it? So yeah, it, it does. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Obviously, it's um, experience matters a lot. And Georgetown is probably one of the exceptional places as far as hospitals is concerned that allows um, that we hire um, uh, new grads and let them do the same amount of teaching time and structure as the rest of us old guys. Um, most places make the new guys, you know, do very few educational stuff and more of the, the junk work, the nocturnus gigs and whatnot. So Georgetown is different. Um, and every, every structure, every place you go to, there'll be something different. But yeah, if you were to go out private world and you come back in and, and unless it might be just a little bit harder, um, but you know, we do value experience too. So it, it, if you have a good reason for that, then different story, you know, you wanna make five a million dollars and come back, you'll probably be okay, but you might not get your first academic job that you wanted. Answer your questions, Zima. Yeah, just to echo that, uh, I'll can I echo that real quick. Um, so I I got a job offers from like three or four different places, and um, the one that I chose was based off because my passion is for teaching. And Beth Israel Deaconess, you can basically, if you want, be a hundred percent teaching all year round, which was something that I wanted. Um, but the things you got to think about is at some hospitals, there's a pay scale. So if you want to teach, you get paid less. Whereas if you want to go out to like a community hospital affiliate, you get paid more. 
Um, a lot of places in Boston, for instance, will basically make you be, uh, you know, the in intern for five years again. You have to work nights pre predominantly before you get your way up there. So those are definitely things to think about when you're hiring or when you're job searching for sure, definitely. Um, so we, I'm going to try and talk for Travis. He's going to control the slides um, since the microphone doesn't seem to still be working. But so you can all see probably on the screen question two here. Dr. Poon, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but maybe just touching on why um, both for primary care and for hospitalists, um, you all decided on academic versus community and kind of what your thought process was. And then academics obviously are part of a larger institution sometimes. So you kind of what is that administrative side or, or academic side look like? And you, you also just answer this a little bit, Pat, too. No, I can start. Um, I mean, I, I think that my, I've, obviously I've never worked in a community setting, but I have had friends who work in a community setting as a hospitalist. They're seven on, seven off. We had a hospice program at Wake Forest where they were seven on, seven off. They had very little uh, teaching time. Um, they probably worked with residents maybe one week or two weeks a year. Um, they mostly worked with APPs, PAs, and NPs. Um, they carried a larger number of patients. Um, and I saw a lot, I spoke to them about it when I was deciding between community and academic and there was a high level of burnout. Now I also have a lot of colleagues from my residency program who thought look they felt that they were very comfortable doing medicine on their own. They didn't want to have any learners and you know they wanted to do medicine as like um, that's their job. They you know they're they didn't expect to or want to kind of go on the academic ladder of having to publish or having to like, I guess, like climb a ladder of, of any sort. They, you know, they had other things outside of work that they wanted to focus on and they wanted their job just to be a means of being a doctor and taking care of their patients and didn't want the stress of um, supervising residents. Um, Academic to me allows for kind of the opportunity to wear different hats, which I really enjoy. Kind of the hat of being an educator, of being able to sit in the medical school sometimes, um, and opens up to roles of administration, which also is available in the community setting. Um, and and the, the schedules are always a little bit different. Um, you, you know, our schedule is kind of we work Monday through Friday most weeks and then we'll have a weekend here and there um, but um, you have more flexibility and the academic hospitals who kind of were the lifers that were my role models in in residency you know they only did maybe like 15 to 20 weeks of medicine for closer per year and they spent in um, you know, during their research, running clerkships, and um, some of them are still even the opportunity to do both. So every um, every program is different. Um, I will say that as I was looking for jobs, I was really hoping to find a job where I could do both healthcare and medicine. But it it is increasingly harder. To find that. I find that most academic places are doing both. Uh, are, are doing like you're you really have to apply for either like a hospital's medicine or a primary care medicine job um, so yeah any um, comments from the primary care side or is it somewhat similar I mean not the the, the working quantity of um, weeks and things like that but any other comments from you all um, I think the kind of, it, you know, if you, if you envision someone working in a residency program, if you have a mentor that you've seen here at Georgetown and you say, oh my gosh, I want that job, then academics is for you. Um, otherwise, if you're interested in a particular patient population or, um, you know, if, if you feel that that academic side isn't what 
makes your heart beat, then then I would consider a career in kind of community primary care. Um, I agree that um, there's it's kind of a different workflow in um, in the community and primary care. You're going to be working a lot more sessions um, because there's not you know you're not going to be precepting necessarily um, in a resident clinic, uh, but that's equally like great and makes some people really excited um, especially if you're at a cool place if you're at a federally qualified healthcare center for example if you're doing something that you're enjoying so um, it kind of goes back to my point of like just find something that you enjoy talk to a doctor who has the job that you want and, and get advice from them i agree with dr ayub completely finding that role model is important um, one comment I guess I would make, Dr. Ayub, is it could be interesting, um, you know, the VA clinic I know is um, a unique place, um, and so is VHC, but sometimes I think our VHC clinic doesn't really embody what a regular um, academic clinic is, so it could be something that we reach out to Brie about and see if there's ways to have some of our medicine residents maybe just also, I know there's the primary care elective um, or some subspecialty clinics um, with that, but it would be something to integrate in, too, for those who are interested in, in primary care, at, yeah. not at base, unfortunately. Yeah such a special place. I mean, I think it um, embodies a lot of the coolest of all worlds, right? It's like a community place, they're underserved patients, and then also it's a kind of resident-run practice. So it, it is definitely unique and, and pretty wonderful. You had kind of outlined this um, really well from a hospital side. I think we've touched on some of these topics. Um, unless anybody else has anything to add, do you guys want to move on to the next question? You will, in primary care, you will like regret ever signing up for one of those headhuntery things because they will just pester you over email. You will get so much spam. And uh, there's always, they always send you like really enticing pictures of like a primary care doctor on the beach, like with a laptop. And you're like, oh my God, where is that place? It's so awesome. And then you realize you've wasted like 10 minutes on a pointless email. So. <laughs> So Carrie's question is that in, internal hires, um, it doesn't mean how the process happens. Is that is I guess, is that the question? Um, once again, this is you reaching out directly to the person you, you probably worked with before and just saying, hey, I'm interested in being a hospitalist, what can I do? Um, so like we're trying to get Carrie, maybe hopefully Travis too for the following year. <laughs> um, Michael uh, Molino is already aware of that and hopefully, you know, we can, have a space slash fire somebody and then hire you two to be our future hospitalist. So it's not, it, we prefer internal hires, of course, it's good quality control We have a history with you and you know everything about us already for the most part. So, but it's not, it, this is easy. This is where it, it makes it so easy for you to get hired anywhere in our hospital system. Just a matter of reaching out to that person. Um, the timing, of course, it wouldn't hurt now to tell uh, the summer or fall saying, hey, I'm really interested in staying at Georgetown um, or staying at Fairfax. Do you have a hire? And, you know, we all know Ashik Manan over over Fairfax and he just, he'll probably be drooling all, all over any of the Georgetown residents who are graduating. Um, you guys, this is, our discussion here is about looking for a job. It's not really about once you go for an interview and what you look for. Down the line, you guys have questions when you, before the interview, please reach out to us who's gone through it already so we can talk to you about what to look for everybody will sell you the same thing about how the wonderful how much time these shifts they have and how great things look but there are there are certain things you should look at um when you talk to these people and certain questions you should have to make sure that this is the a job that's not only going to be for a year or two to burn out and, and more like a lifelong um lifelong uh career for you Yeah, and just for the local hires, I mean, Georgetown and VA have a ton of people who went to Georgetown residency um, and are hired and working there now. So that's obvious. I'm not as sure about um, Hospital Center, Virginia, like Washington Hospital Center, or VHC, uh, or Fairfax internal hires for primary care, but I'm sure there are some, um, or, you know, or there have been some. And then also like Kaiser, One Medical, those other um, different kind of groups, there's, there's plenty that have gone through our residency and work there now. Um, we can always connect you with them for local stuff, for sure. And I would add totally. GW, as, I mean, we don't have as many Georgetown residents who go there, but it's still another academic hospital um, in the area. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and so that's another thing to think about. Yep. If you go to GW, I will sterilize you. <laughs> <laughs> that's only fair.
<laughs> only fair, Matt. <laughs> it's definitely um, easy. It's really want to. Like uh, internal hires are always, you know, kind of a little more seamless. Um, uh, there's pluses and minuses though, right? Because you grow a lot by going somewhere else. Um, I, I think you, can't, you obviously can't go wrong staying at a place like Georgetown, but um, there is something nice also about like kind of branching out and seeing another place. Um, from a logistics side and a hiring side, it's definitely again, easy to hire an internal person. You like, you have, you've, you've vetted them for three years. It's easy to know how, what their clinical skills are like. Um, my big take home on this is to not, uh, to, is to realize that a lot of uh, recruiting and job offers are dependent on a, a capacity. So it, there were a few years in GIM where we just like, we were like, oh, uh, you know, Justin Musafi, he's great, let's hire him. Then Allison Wendell, she's great, let's hire her. Um, you know, it's, it's, at some point you realize that a division has to think about the, their bigger picture, their mission and at some point unfortunately the bottom line you know, one of the biggest uh one of the saddest day in, in primary care was uh when we realized that we just simply couldn't hire one of the best docs in the world connor benton um which in the end was like better you know great for him he got a chance to branch out and and um experience a different kind of practice but i would say it's important to not to, um is to, to realize that there's like that business side of medicine so if it's like serendipitous and it works out it's great but if not You'll, you'll do great um, no matter where you are. And there's annoying things like uh, business that, that come into the decisions. And Pat Sheeney says, dodged a bullet by not getting Connor mentioned. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, right. I, have a, I would have a puppy in my office right now if That's I did. True. So. <laughs> the one thing to also uh, consider is, so let's say you're really geographically restricted and you want to go to like your dream hospital is, I don't know, John Hopkins, but you, because your family lives in Baltimore and you decide to go get a job in University of Maryland for a year before you go to John Hopkins. One thing to think about is that some places there's non-compete clauses and you like can't prematurely leave your contract and go to a place that's within, you know, a certain mileage of uh, your most recent contract. So that was one thing to think about um when applying for jobs uh, that i at least thought about to some extent yeah that let me add to that a little bit when i first started there was no such thing as non-compete clause and then unfortunately medstar this is the non-compete clause is really more applicable towards specialists and i i would imagine primary care doctors to marry them, but it's not really relevant to hospitals because we're not like we they people come to see us right we just get whoever comes to the er and so forth so you know, and Georgetown does have a non-compete clause because unfortunately MedStar, we're part of MedStar and it's pretty tough at my understanding that you can't practice anywhere at MedStar World, which is DMV. Um, but that being said, um, the way we had talked to uh, our applicants in the past, as well as with Dr. Lux and, and the MedStar folks said that if you get hired through Georgetown, um, Georgetown you leave here, Luxon supposedly can write a letter saying that we would not enforce a non-compete clause on your, on your departure. So, you know, it's, it is, require a lot of trust. Um, uh, I know that our one of our hospitalists had left here not in a very good manner years back and then she's working locally not like we we don't care she did, someone else can have her. So you know it's one of those things that's not really enforced. Um, uh, it is hard to take someone's word for it and obviously we for the most part we try to get a job that's indefinite and that's just for a year or two. So I would, you know, it's unfortunately at the more place you go to, especially systems, they will have these non-compete clause and, and, and it's, it's hard to know what to do with it, whether you're going to um, uh, take faith, lead, take a leap of faith and hopefully they when if you do quit this job that they won't enforce it or not. Um, but I know Georgetown won't enforce the non-compete clause per the host, uh, per Dr. Luxon and Dr. Mullen now. In um, primary care, they absolutely will uh, enforce a non-compete clause, um, especially, you know, something to think about if you're joining a, a health system, as Amarin talked about, right? So when this was just Georgetown University Hospital, I think it was less, less of a big deal. Um, when joining a bigger corporation like MedStar, um, yes, they have kind of, they have to be internally consistent. Um, 
Uh, there is a non-compete clause. GIM will be transitioning over to a MedStar Medical Group group um, in January of 2021. And so all of our colleagues will be having to agree to non-compete clauses. Now, what that really means is that you wouldn't be able to practice um, in medicine as a primary care doctor um, at a competing institution. So really that means uh, academics. I mean, if you wanted to shut down, you know, your operation here at GIM and um, go into private practice, that wouldn't really be a direct competition, but joining one, like for example, the, the Hopkins groups or GW um, would be a violation of that non-compete clause and it definitely would be um, enforced. I think it's something like 50 miles as well. So this is, I think, somewhat tangential to that, but this next question on negotiation. Um, obviously, there's a lot of nuances and specifics, so it's a little bit hard to talk in too much detail at this point in the process, but just kind of a general overview um, of anything that you think is pertinent. You've, you've again, touched on some of this already. Um, to start, cut the, unfortunately, if you're, if you're gonna be a new grad, I don't think that's, that's gonna be tough to try to sell your work to people. Um, that being said, you know, little but little budgets in um, little little negotiation for miles sal salary is probably gonna be tougher because we all people come in with a certain amount of we have most hostels have certain structure that people come in at as far as negotiating for moving and stuff i guess that's always doable um but uh there's not much negotiation when it's a systems-based contract private hospitals group perhaps and probably um, but you know what? What you really should look for is really the transparency in in these jobs, as far as the people, uh, the, the the salary of, salary and bonuses of people who's been there. Obviously, if you can see that you can be that tra trajectory in two years, be that person, maybe then you won't fight so hard to be get hired at a higher salary. So I think that's probably more important when you go into these places to see what is the. Um, that you, you have the numbers laid out in front of you of the guys who's been here for two years versus the guy who's been here for 10 years. Most of these places, they don't, at least, a, at least the academic one, they don't, they don't tell you your, your salary in the beginning. I know Dr. Molino, when he calls people, when he talks to him on the phone for the initial discussion, I don't think he throws out the numbers out there. You, only after the interview, this, then he then tells you, uh, when he gives you an offer, here's the salary going forward. When I interview people, I should tell them because they need to know these kind of things, you know, how, make sure they're how interested they are. But it's, the numbers aren't out there initially in the academic world. Um, but just once when you go there, you should ask the hospitalist who knows the monies to discuss about what is the, the compensation, the structure, what is the, the looking forward, cost of living, and all that, that stuff. But negotiating is, is not easy. Um, so that being said, you know, people always ask, should we have people look at contract like a lawyer? just in case a lawyer can spot something that is kind of shady, but unfortunately MedStar, you can, the lawyer can look at it and you can say, I'm not happy with this part, but MedStar is not gonna budge. So um, for those com people who come to MedStar, I don't, you know, you read through it, but it's like, well, MedStar is not gonna change, so why waste 300 bucks on a lawyer fees? I don't know whether Dr. Poon had a lawyer looked at it or not, but, but yeah. once again, they, they're, they're not gonna budge. Right, so I, I didn't um, because I knew that um, it was pretty set because it's MedStar and coming into an academic position, but I did have friends, again, who were in my residency program who went to places purely for the sake of make, like, I, making money and they were okay with going to smaller places. So they went to kind of middle of nowhere, California, or like places in the South where, you know, they really need doctors. And then that's where you really have the negotiating power. And so if you're interested in working in a place um, where they really need doctors, not in a big metropolitan area like DC, then absolutely I would recommend getting a lawyer to look through it to make sure that you're getting the best thing because they really need doctors. And so you have a lot more negotiating power um, to get the best deal for yourself. Um, but I, I think that if you're coming to a place in academics in a large city, I think then that, and you know, at least that was my experience and after talking to a lot of different people about whether or not I should get a lawyer, um, I don't know if Pat did or not going up to ha uh, Boston, but I didn't think that there was any value in getting a lawyer for myself. 
No, I, I didn't get a lawyer either. Um, the only time I think if it's necessary, just to kind of uh, echo what you're saying, Dr. Poon, to get a lawyer is if you're going to those smaller places where usually it's like a headhunter emails you and they're like, oh, there's uh, no mosquitoes here and it's never raining and you get $700,000 a year. There's usually a caveat in there. Uh, like if you don't work for two years, you end up having to pay back half of those bonuses or something. Um, so that was, that'd be the only time I would recommend getting a lawyer is if you're going to academic places, it's like standard contracts everywhere. They're very, the contracts are lengthy, but they make easy sense. Um, the, and then when I, so I did try and negotiate my contract because I was offered a few jobs. And so once I picked which one I want, I said, Hey, listen, I got a relocation fee uh, and another offer at this place. Can you at least match this? And I was able to get that matched. So um, it, I, you know, I, I didn't know if it was going to work or not, but it did. So I'm happy that it did, but it never hurts to ask. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to get it if you don't ask for it. I agree um, with everything that's been said. Great advice. Um, have a benchmark idea in your mind about what seems appropriate to you. I mean, when you're a resident, pretty much any amount of money is more than you're making. So <laughs> I remember being a resident and being absolutely shocked when I found out like that a primary care job would definitely be six figures. So like that's how low my standard was. Okay. Um, a good resource for academic jobs is to look at double AMC data um, this is published data. It does require, I think you have to pay for the report or something, but your the administrators in your program should have a copy. Um, I, I don't know how to share my screen because I'm not so savvy, but I'll at least like turn around my camera on an email here. Let's see, so for example, they'll usually be by um, academic rank amount. So these are like, the, you can look at the 25th, 50th and 75th percentile across the country of um, salaries by, by academic rank. And they have this for general medicine. They would have it for hospital medicine. Um, interpret with caution, those are total compensation um, numbers. So that includes uh, your base salary as well as any other kind of uh, bonus type money you would be receiving. But um, one important take home point is you will do fine no matter where you go in terms of salary, because it turns out doctors get paid a lot of money. All right, Travis, you wanna to go to the last question that we have for everybody just with a couple minutes left. This one um, is kind of a little bit more in this, especially for Matt, Zama, and whoever else is gonna to listen to this um, recorded about um, anything in the meantime, any particular conferences or different resources to use in, in that in the first, second, third year time period. So having gone through, I think I've gone to ACP, I've gone to SGIM. Um, I thought those were really valuable uh, resources as a resident that every hospitalist, primary care doctor, every generalist I talked to was just really excited that I wasn't going to be um, subspecializing. And so they were all just excited to mentor me. Like I got so many business cards at each of these conferences that I went to just to say, hey, reach out. I, and it's nice to get the different perspectives from different institutions. Um, you can never get too much advice. Um, so I got, um, you know, speaking of CV templates, I got a CV template from somebody in, in Utah, you know, and things like that. So just going to different working groups, going to different um, just hospitalist meetings, um, sessions at some of these conferences and then introducing yourself, hey, I'm a resident, I'm interested in hospital medicine or primary care. You kind of get like a flock of people who want to mentor you and give you advice, um, which I, I thought it was helpful just hearing the different perspectives. The Georgetown perspective is one perspective, but hearing how other people have gone about it and kind of advice um, from other places is really helpful. Any other comments from anybody? It's also okay if there aren't. 
we're almost at the end of our hour here. So. Um, yep. Talk, talk to, um, you know, talk to Sean Walton, talk to Dennis Murphy, talk to people so that they can get you in touch with specific people who have um, graduated from the program that, that would be like invaluable resources. Perfect. Any kind of final comments? I feel like each of you guys have um, been able to contribute a lot and help us, I think, and help hopefully our interns, um, honestly helping me too, as a future hospitalist. Um, but I'll just give a couple minutes in case anybody has final comments, or I'll, if not, show pictures of Cody taking a nap. Um, Dr. Poon, I know you briefly were talking to Travis about fellowships. I was just curious about, like, um, you know, hospital medicine fellowships in general. I know that, like, those are kind of a new trend. Um, and then I think you were mentioning some of the other types of fellowships uh, for hospital medicine. If you could just go back to that. Yeah, so last year when I was still a chief resident, I was talking to my mentors and a lot of them had pushed me towards doing um, internal medicine fellowships or hospital medicine fellowships. These are usually one to two years where um, you can, a lot of these programs will um, help you get like a master's in education um, or some sort of formal training in education. If this is, if you know that you want to be committed to like um, being a lifelong academic physician, it also um, will provide some of the resources to help with um, getting the research skills that you might want if you um, want to climb that ladder in a academic setting, um, do research in the future. Um, it was something that I looked into. I personally looked into it too late um, and um, just didn't have the research profile from my residency, I think, to be very competitive. These are competitive fellowships and something that you should look into this summer if it is something where that you want to go into where you just feel like you want to gain more research skills, you wanna be a kind of a research academic educator of some sort, some combination of that, where you want to buy down your time and maybe be like 30, 40% academics and like, 50% clinical, um, having that in your back pocket would be helpful in that type of job search. It's different than um, kind of what we have at Georgetown as an academic hospitalist. Um, I clearly don't have any of those skills. And um, as if you if you look at um, like Alex Montero had an academic um, uh, internal medicine fellowship and he certainly has like kind of the masters and the skills to do a lot of research. Um, so it's, it's helpful if that's where you see your career going. Um, I kind of wish that somebody had spoken to me about it earlier so that I could apply for it earlier um, and, and potentially make myself more competitive for that. Um, but it, if that's where you see yourself going, there's lots of great programs out there um, who will take maybe like three to five per year. Hopkins is a local one that's really popular. Um, and then there's also um, the one at UCSF was the other one I was looking at. Um, and I think at Hopkins, you can potentially get an MPH out of it, but I think that's like a two or three year program. So more training, if you're looking for a career path where you don't do a fellowship, this would probably will not be for you, but if you're looking for a career path, um, especially for the chiefs that are on this call, who like might want to get more training in formal education, education theory, research skills, um, that might be something for you to look into. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Dr. Poon. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, you guys are already such great resources for all of us. Um, and I am sure you will continue to be. And if you guys are reading in the comments, multiple people have offered to help kind of in this process. So um, I'm sure we'll reach out to you again at some point to, to do more of these, but thank you for your time. Yeah, email me anytime. Good awesome. luck. Thank you. And then here's... Yes, look at her. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,
Sorry. Hey. Yo, can you guys hear us? No. Can't hear anything. What if we do a 